This morning we're jumping into a series on prayer, and it's a four-week series where we're going to look at all facets of prayer. We're going to talk about what it's what it means to pray, what does it matter, how do we pray, different ways to pray, and, and I want to uh, end it all with a specific prayer that I'm, I'm working on writing for our church, that we might unified together pray together. And so I think it's going to be uh, a really special series for us. And this morning I wanted to start off by sharing three, uh, three true stories. And so the first story that I wanted to share was, um, was it takes place in 2015. And so I was, in, uh, I was in South Carolina at the time as a youth pastor at a small church called Walnut Hill Baptist Church. And um, I was just a little bit out of high school at that point, and I was still in college. I was in, I was in class one day, and, and I was like, you know, I need to visit my students uh, at lunch. I always loved it when my youth pastor came and visited me at lunch, and so I was like, I'm going to go do that. And I, I went to my old alma mater, Chapman High School, and, and I'm sitting there at lunch with some of my students, and a, a young, uh, happy-go-lucky, charismatic guy with, with hair as blonde, so blonde it looked white, came and sat down uh, beside me, and, and we started to strike up a conversation. Um, his name was Aze Woodard. He was a great a great kid, and we just had good conversations, laughed a lot. I invited him to a youth event that we were doing uh, just that later that month, and, and uh, he was just a great kid. And, and I did not know that after having just bumped into him this one time, that one specific day, that the next day when I was in class, I get a phone call from one of my students saying, hey, Aze, this has been a really bad car accident. Um, could, you, could you go and visit him and his family? And, and that's all that I heard. And I, I was like, of course, yes, I'll, I'll definitely go. And, and so I, I make my way to the hospital um, and, I, and I'm checking and like hearing from other people like, hey, hey, this is a big, a big event for the high school. Um, many of you have probably been through or witnessed uh, members of the community that have either passed or have been in tragic car accidents. And this was one for Chapman High School. And I just so happened to have ran into him the day before. And so I, I show up to the hospital and uh, in, in just shambles. I mean, a, a young guy hanging on to, to life by a thread. He's in a, he's in a doctor's induced coma lying there on the bed motionless, and the family is all distraught. And I'm a young youth pastor that's met this guy one time. I, I don't know the family from Adam, yet I'm, I'm bawling with them. I'm crying with them. I'm, I'm hearing their stories. And, and all that I knew to do in my young faith and young service as a youth pastor at that time was to pray. And, and so I, I laid my hands on A's, and I prayed with the family, I mean, begging prayers, asking God, help Ace. Would you save Ace? Would you do something, God? And, and, I, kid, and I kid you not, this is, this is a miraculous act of God. As I have my hands on A's, praying with him, crying and begging, the family shakes my shoulder and says, he's waking up, he's waking up. His eyes began to, to open up, and, and, and he, he couldn't say or speak or do anything, but his eyes were, were, he was getting out of this coma, and he was coming too. And, and the family was just, and all of us were in awe. I mean, what has just happened? The doctors come in, they call the family, uh, the family's calling the doctors in, and they come in, and, and this is the words of a non-Christian, non-praying doctor that says, this is miraculous, this is absolutely, this wasn't supposed to happen. This was anything short of a miracle. And, and we saw it before our eyes. A's, this young, happy-go-lucky guy, got hit with this moment, was nearly taken out. And, and I got to, to see this miracle happen before my eyes through the, through the act of prayer. And that's nothing to do with me, but everything to do with God. And, and Aze is doing fantastic now. Here's a photo of him and his girls. He has three beautiful girls. Him and, him and Annie are doing great. And, and so Aze is, is doing well today. And it's just an incredible act of God in that moment. Second story. There is this single mom named Monica. Monica is, uh, she had this one son and she was a doubt, devout believer who would pray over her son and sing hymns over him every night as he would go to sleep. 
And unfortunately, though, as, as she's doing all of this, uh, her son would, would grow up to, to see the world in a completely different way than he did, or than she did. He would actually become known as the city's public drinker, a, a public drunk, and was a womanizer. He was well known for these things. He eventually would also use his intellect and his knowledge to study philosophy to the point where he would work uh, all of these ways to argue against the fate that his mom had brought him up on. But Monica didn't give up. Monica prayed for her son's salvation day in and day out. And it was when he was 19 years old that she received a dream that she believed came from God where God told her that I'm hearing your prayers and I will answer them on behalf of your son. And so her prayers began to be intensified. She would pray more and more and a year passed and another year passed and another year passed until nine years later, as her, she was praying again, her son would go and sit in this garden and would open up the scriptures that he became, uh, he was known for despising and would come into relationship with Jesus on his own in that garden. His name is St. Augustine. He is the most famous father in church history, arguably one of the greatest theologians of our time. And many of us know his story, but many of us don't know the story of his praying mom. Prayer, there's power in it. The third and final story. Young Song Presbyterian Church in Seoul, Korea, it started a morning prayer group about 20 years ago. There was 40 people that it started off with, and they would go on to continue to pray every day of the week. Today, if you were to attend this prayer service, you would be attending with more than 12,000 people every single day, gathering Monday through Friday, or every day, Monday through Friday, um, they would get there in the morning to pray. So much so, there's so many people flocking to these prayer meetings that they actually have to split them up into three different ones, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., and 6 a.m. prayer meetings. And so they lock the doors every hour on the hour because it's standing room only to walk into this place and pray and ask that God would move. And, and I have some photos here. So, well, that was Monica there and her praying son. But look at these photos. This is their auditorium in Seoul, Korea, filled with people praying and calling out to the Lord. These are breakout rooms filled to the brim of people calling out to God to move in a mighty way. See, prayer, there's power in it. And prayer is this compelling wonder, right? I mean, you hear stories like that and you're just like, wow. Look at what God can do. God acting on earth on behalf of, of a prayer of a human being. I mean, how incredible is that? That God is that powerful, yet that personal. And that's what prayer is about. Prayer is this confounding wonder, but it's also a confounding mystery. Because half of us in here are probably extremely motivated by those three stories that I shared Yet equally, there's probably another half of people that are confused, if not a little angered, by those stories. Because you're beginning to replay your prayers and those times that you have your own personal version of those stories and they don't have a neat, tidy ending. There's not a bow that you can tie on it and use it for the, for the beginning of a sermon like we did this morning. You might be like, hey man, you know, God healed your friend. That's great, but why not others? What about the people who have prayed those exact same prayers and God did nothing? If we insist on celebrating these divine healings, Cody, then what about divine silence? Or, you know, I'm really happy for Augustine and his mom. Like, that's, that's pretty cool. I'm happy for them. But why did he take that long to answer? I mean, if he was going to answer it anyway, why did he wait nine years like that? Like, that's, that's really sweet. I mean, is there a combination of, like, time spent praying plus method of prayer, plus people praying that equals God answering? Like, what, what is going on here? Like, I don't understand. In what other context in life does someone holding out that amount of power find it okay in our eyes? And okay, yes, that's great that, you know, the, uh, the Koreans are, are praying and, and they have such that many people there, but can you give me any metrics to show that something's actually happening? I mean, there's people on both sides of the spectrum, those who would say, man, it's incredible what God has done in those stories, and then others who are just playing their own personal life journeys to the side and saying, I don't, I don't have that answer. I don't have that experience. 
And so the question I think that we're all circling around at times, if we're honest, is does prayer actually matter? Do my prayers actually matter? And that's what our text, or that's what our, our uh, sermon today is all about, is why prayer matters, why it does. Like, is anything going to happen in this world just because I don't pray? Do my prayers matter? There's a novelist named Kurt Vonnegut, and he, he gives this quote. He speaks on this question and says, you know, I don't think it at all likely that God requires the ill-informed and contradictory advice of humans uh, of us humans as to how to run the world. If he is all wise, and as you say he is, and, and I mean, doesn't he already know what is best? And if he is all good, then won't he do it whether we pray or not? I mean, it's, it's quite, I mean, he has a point. What a great quote, right? And I think that some of us would say, man, those stories that you shared, yes, love it. And yet, we have that wonder, and yet on the other side, some of us might be here with Kurt Vonnegut and say, you know, I don't know. I struggle. I have doubts. I have, I'm confused about prayer. And so here in this space, we find ourselves with wonder and mystery when it comes to prayer, and sometimes it paralyzes us. Yes, prayer is powerful, and then we begin to pray, and we start to have our own doubts, our own confusion, our own struggles and past disappointments, and so we we get lost. Now, don't get me wrong, though. We still continue to pray, but I don't really think that we pray powerful prayers. We pray safe prayers. We pray prayers that we probably couldn't even measure or tell if God's answering them or not because we're praying safely. Statistically, this week, according to Gallup research, more Americans will pray than will exercise, drive a car, have sex, or go to work. Nine out of ten Americans will pray regularly, and three out of four will say that they pray every day. See, we keep praying, but I'm not sure if it's in response to Jesus. And so I want to call us to that this morning. And so as a thought experiment for us, something that's going to bookend our time together today is this thought. Consider everything that you have prayed for in the last week. Just think about that. If God answered every single one of those prayers, what would happen? If God answered every one of your prayers, what would happen? I thought it was a good question to consider. I mean, save one or two of us who are a little naive or bold, the answer is honestly most times not much. Because either we're not praying or or praying for very little. And that's because the space between wonder and mystery and prayer, it paralyzes us. And so Jesus, at, or his, his disciples ask him, hey, how do we pray? And Jesus starts praying. He says this here. He says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. And we pause there and we're like, man, what a wonderful way to start. I mean, one God, one Father over all peoples. I love it. Great way to start. Hallowed be your name. And we, we're a little eh about that. Because hallowed means to praise. And, and, and some cynics and stuff might say, you know, I mean, why? I mean, is God really that narcissistic that we have to come to him and butter him up? Like, why is it that I can't just come to him with the things I really want to talk about first? But I get it. He's all powerful and all loving. I should probably start off that way. Hallowed be your name. Then he goes on, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and that's where Jesus loses us, right there. He loses us there because we don't really pray like his kingdom is going to come. We don't really pray expecting something more to happen. We, we honestly are more selfish with our prayers, and we're praying for our own kingdom to be okay and our own kingdom to come and flourish, if we're, if we're honest. And so, like, we don't believe that God's kingdom is going to come and make an actual difference in the lives of people and the problems that they have. He loses us there. But Jesus has tried absolutely everything to not lose us at this point. He, he, I mean, I'm just going to give you a quick survey of quotes from Jesus as it speaks to prayer. This is Jesus here. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you received it and it will be yours. 
Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. If you believe, you will receive whatever it is that you ask from him. If then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give to those who ask him? These are quotes from Jesus, just saying, ask, believe, and it will be given. And so if we really took what Jesus is saying, the invitation that Jesus gives here seriously, we would have the same problem as those in Korea. We, we would be having to turn people away because the room is so packed because of what God can do. But we don't. Because I don't think that we actually believe it. We don't buy it. At least not all of us anyway. And so it's true, prayer is both a wonder and a mystery, but more than anything else, it's an invitation. It's an invitation. It's not just for the pious people who, you know, know, are really close to Jesus, and it's not just for the lucky people who just got their prayer answered. It's for all of us. We are all called to go to God in prayer. And so the place that we get lost is the on earth as it is in heaven part. But did you know that on earth as it is in heaven when it comes to prayer it actually is a, is a, a specific kind of prayer called, uh, called intercessory prayer. And I have the definition up here. I mean, it, that's a 10 cent seminary word that simply means to pray for someone else, to intercede, to interject, is to pray for someone else. We're talking about love for someone that goes beyond our power to give, and so we go to God in prayer. Kind of like what we've been doing for Weston's family. Michael uh, started this prayer page, Scottsdale prayer page, and then the Weston family has started this prayer page as well, and we've been praying for little Weston, and it's been incredible to see the comments and all of the, the camaraderie and just coming together and actually praying and believing, and man, God's moving, and, and it's, it's things like that. My, pray, my favorite definition of intercessory prayer comes from Richard Foster. He says, if we truly love people, We will desire for them far more than is within our power to give them, and this will lead us to prayer. I mean, what a beautiful definition for intercessory prayer. It's selfless prayer. It's a love for the other. It's this invitation that we've been given by Jesus to pray for others. But we get stuck because more often than not, we're selfishly praying rather than selflessly praying. And, and that's, that's where we struggle. And how, so how do we get back there? How is it that we get back to the on earth as it is in heaven style praying? Well, I want to go back to the very beginning. I, I want to go to God's original plan for prayer and talk about that and unpack that this morning. So for the next seven minutes, I'm going to cover all of the Bible in, in, in four major episodes, okay? <laughs> Creation, fall, promise, and Jesus. It's the story of the Bible as it relates to prayer. And you're thinking, oh man, here we go. It's, it, I feel like I'm losing some of you already. Dial in, dial in, because I believe God has something specific to say to you and to me this morning from this text. And so as we start with episode one, creation, it's the life that God intended. All the way back in Genesis 1 at the very beginning, God created Adam. And so now, what I want you to know, though, is that this word Adam in the original Hebrew is is Adam. It means humankind. And so the claim at the heart of Genesis is that it isn't just a story about God and this dude named Adam, but it's a story about all of us. It's about every single one of us, every individual story. And so do you know what you were created for? Do you know why it is that you were created Genesis 1, 26, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over. And then it goes on to list everything that was created in the first five days. So why is it that you were created? Why is it that I was created? The biblical claim here is that we were created to rule. But that's not this like manipulative, power-hungry rule. It's this imago Dei, image authority that's been bestowed to us we were set apart in creation to live self uh, with selfless love as intercessors 
to intercede here on earth as it is in heaven for God on this planet. We are given that rule. So God made Adam and Eve to distribute his authority here on earth. They're intercessors. They intercede as we intercede in prayer. So God does not just give us the earth, but God actually shares management of the earth with us, his intercessors. God created you and I to manage this world, to care for this world, and to share his kingdom with it. And now you may be asking, if you're still paying attention, well then where in the world did it all go wrong? Well, it's a great question. It leads us to episode two, the life that we actually live. It's the fall. I mean, if God's plan is for us to steward creation, to care for it well, then what in the world happened? We're doing a pretty subpar job. I mean, scientists are currently putting an end date on the Earth's ability to sustain life. Natural, uh, natural resources that are, are getting pillaged from countries that desperately need them to feed countries that are having plenty and doing just fine. Half the world is dying of malnutrition and the other half is dying of obesity. I mean, where in the world did God's intentions of creation go so horribly wrong? Well, the scriptures make the claim that all of this dysfunction that we see is a product of deception. You and I lost who it is that we are called to be, who it is that the role that we are called to live. That's what it is. Satan tempts Adam and Eve. They believe this deception. They act on the deception and pain and suffering. Sin enters the world. And there's this communication breach that happens and there's this break between the communication of God and us. They believe this deception and it falls. It, it, it causes us to fall. The Genesis story goes like this. You have a spiritual enemy. His weapon of choice is deception. And the product of that deception is brokenness. It's paralyzation. The authority and rule that God gave us in Genesis 1 is stolen. It's taken by Satan in Genesis 3. As intercessors, our role as intercessors that God created us for, it's lost. And the spiritual enemy, is, it, it takes it. And, and what happens is we're paralyzed. And that all might sound technical. That all might, maybe that's confusing you. Let me tell it to you like this. I have a friend named Daniel and he's really big into bikes. And, and Daniel uh, was riding his motorcycle one time, and he actually cracked his skull and was taken into the hospital, and he was left with a brain injury. Daniel would go on to live the next several months in a rehab facility because part of his brain was damaged that connected his, his brain with the motor skills and whatnot to his limbs. And so he would be laying there in the hospital bed or in the rehab saying, hey, right hand move. And nothing happens. And so there was this disconnect that happened here between his brain and his limbs. The communication breach had happened between his head and his body. That's what happened in Genesis 3. We are trapped in this communication breach of sorts. God created you and I with this inseparable communication between his heart and our actions. We're, we're called his body in the scripture. And so, if, but if we look around, all we see is dysfunction. All we see is brokenness, and that's because we lack the capacity on our own to make right what God desires us to do. We're sinful, broken people, and so we do selfish things rather than selfless. Because somewhere between God's mind and our actions, there's been a communication breach. We still carry the perfect image of God in us, the Imago Dei. We, look, we are created in God's image, it says, and we're created to tend to this beautiful creation and yet, we lack the ability to carry out the management on our own. And so that brings us to episode three, the promise. It's a guaranteed victory. We're in Genesis chapter three, verse 15. And you're thinking, Cody, you said you're going through the whole Bible in this, and we're still in Genesis three. Hold on, we're, we're gonna speed through here. Because this promise that is made here in Genesis, 5, or Genesis 3, 15, it, 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 it completely pervades all of scripture. Genesis 3.15, God is speaking to Satan and says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. I emphasize head there because that head is a biblical image for manager, for intercessor, for leader. And so God's very first promise that he makes immediately after the authority he's given you and me has been taken and it's been lost 
is that I'm going to send someone that's going to restore what it is that has been lost. God's very first promise to you and me is that I will make you intercessors again. I will make you intercessors again. And this brings us to episode four, Jesus, the living victory. The prophet Isaiah in, the, in chapter nine says this, that to us a child is born, to, uh, to, uh, to, to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. God is coming to earth. The author that wrote the story is entering the story. For us, a child is born. Man, that slaps at Christmas. We love that. Man, the child is born. Thank God. Praise God. But there's something more there, too. It says that the government will be on his shoulders. That's Genesis language. He's coming back to win the authority that you and I lost to repair the communication breach that is there that we might have this promise. That's the promise that he gives us is that it's going to be restored. And then in John chapter 12, Jesus shows up and he says this. Now is the time for judgment of the world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I highlighted the ruler of this world because this is significant. Here's why. Why is it that you were created? Y'all remember? To rule. That's why we were created. Now, what did Jesus just call Satan? Satan. The ruler of this world. This Genesis language. And what is Jesus' promise? That ruler of this world is going to be cast out. That's the Genesis promise. The head will be smashed. That The authority that was taken will be taken back. That's the very close of the story about the promise that he gives us. Is that that, hit, that heel will be crushing the head. That authority is going to be taken back. At the very close of the Gospels, after his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus sums up the whole thing in Matthew 28 by saying this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's saying, hey, I've won back the authority. I've recovered the position from which I created you that was lost. I stepped into the tension that you feel in your everyday life, and I've cut away through it. I made you an intercessor again. That is what Jesus has done. Now you might say, all of that sounds great, Cody. So happy you went through all of the Bible in that way. But what does this have to do with prayer? I'm so glad that you asked. Jesus is going to clarify that in one of the most confusing things that he ever said. This is Jesus in John 16, verse 7. He says, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> I must go, right? I mean, it's, it's the classic breakup speech. It's not you, it's me, I, I must go. But actually, it's the furthest thing from the truth, right? Because he's talking about prayer. In that very same breath, Jesus is going to go on to say these words in John 16, verses 23 through 24. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. He repeats that, in my name, in my name, in my name there. He's saying, hey, you've gotten used to bringing all of your requests, all of your concerns, all of your questions and complaints directly to me, but I've got to go. I'm not going to be here in person any longer, but I'm actually going to make a way that you can go straight to the Father, cut out the middleman, so to speak. And so he's talking about prayer here. Prayer is this pathway that you and I get to go back into this communion with God. It's the original plan. Prayer is the way that we can rule and manage and intercede in this world. Prayer is the repair of the communication breach that happened back in Genesis 3. That we can actually communicate and commune with God again. That is what prayer is. Philip Yancey says this, commenting on these verses that we just read. Of all the means God could have used, prayer seems the weakest, slipperiest, and easiest to ignore. And man, isn't that true? It is, unless Jesus was right in saying the most baffling thing and the making the most baffling claim that he would go away for our sake to form, with this form of, of power sharing 
with you and me. He invites us to be in direct communication with God and gives us this crucial role of struggling against the forces of evil in this world with him. God has shared his power with you. God has shared his power with me. God's calling you and me to be managers of heaven while walking here on earth. And so Jesus is telling his 12 closest disciples and followers, until now, you've really never prayed. Not like I designed it. You know, you never really prayed in my name, he says, over and over again. And a better translation of that, in my name, is under my authority. Stop we need, to, we need to stop praying and, and adding this in my name as a tagline on the end of prayers. Like it was never meant to just be a tagline there at the end of Christians' prayers. It's actually this exercise of Jesus' authority that in his name he can do much more than we can accomplish on our own. So we pray in his name. It means that we have the same access to God's power, God the Father, as Jesus did. So what, am I try- what I'm trying to get you to see and get me to see is that when God won back our authority, God was winning back prayer. God was winning back prayer. Prayer essentially is us entering into the heavenly vault, collecting everything that we can in our arms and then distributing it amongst the world. That's what prayer is. It's to intercede, to say to God, hey, there's some things over here that that we need to get to. Hey, there's some people over here that we need to step into their lives. Hey, God, there's some some bad things happening over in this part of the world. I want to pray for that. And it's taking these heavenly resources and distributing them all over the place and saying, God, your will be done on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. And we're doing that work interceding. That's what prayer is. When we pray, it's distributing God's resources all over Scottsville, among your coworkers, your roommates, your neighbors, and all of your friends, over the bars and the cafes and the soup kitchens, over the young professionals running up into Charlottesville and all over the place to work, and the stay-at-home parents, the kids who are in school and the retirees who are sitting at home, those in the high-rises and those in the prisons and on the streets. That is what prayer is, bringing heaven to earth. It restores our world, and we're called to do it. That's the power of prayer. But if we're honest, we really don't like prayer. If we're honest, we pray out of guilt or obligation. We know it's good for us and we should do it. It's kind of like the spiritual equivalent to like eating celery or some other vegetable, right? We know it's good for us, so we do it. But what if, what if, according to Jesus, we never really prayed? Until now, you have not asked anything in my name, he said. You've never come to plunder the riches of heaven because... I've given you the combination. Just come in. We've never really come to implement the victory that Jesus has already won. And here's the part that just blows me away even more about prayer. is that God doesn't need you. He doesn't need me to be intercessors managing this creation. God is not overwhelmed by the responsibility of all the stuff in this world. He's not startled by it. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful, completely outside of time. He's got this. But God chooses intercessors. He's committed to sharing redemption with you and me. I wonder, I wonder what God is longing to do in this town that he's just waiting for you and me to ask. I wonder. So consider everything that you've prayed for in the last week again if God answered every single one of your prayers what would happen I'm not asking you that to accuse you okay I'm not asking that to make you feel bad or or whatnot I'm asking that because you and I are intercessors you and I are heirs to the throne of God. What are we doing with all of that power, all of that authority? We dream of God, of a God who brings heaven to earth, but he's dreaming of praying people to share heaven with. So what we pray, if we really took Jesus seriously on his invitation to prayer, what would happen? What would happen in this church? 
What would happen in your life personally? What would happen in this town? Why don't we find out?